Hi, this is Don Forsyth. This is the second presentation in a three-part series dealing with Chapter 14's examination of relationships between groups. In the previous presentation, we spoke about the interpersonal factors that can contribute to negative processes, relationships between groups. Um, for example, competition over scarce resources, the tendency for competition to result in conflict at the group level rather than at the individual level, um, power and domination between groups, the tendency for frustrating negative situational factors to trigger aggressive responses, uh, norms uh, that can sustain and encourage negative treatment of members of other groups, and the idea that perhaps evolutionary processes have, have generated an instinctive reaction to outgroup members and that reaction tends to be negative. And now I'd like to turn to the second major topic in the analysis of intergroup relations, um, which is called intergroup biases. Uh, although in the first presentation we focused on primarily situational and group factors that that trigger uh, negative relationships between groups. M many of the, these processes are, occur within the minds of the group members. Uh, the psychological factors that sustain and even encourage uh, a negative response to members of other groups. And we'll consider categorization um, at the beginning, the, the idea that as soon as groups are created, as soon as we can categorize a person within a group, it tends to trigger a negative reaction. And we'll move through to our final topic, which is the tendency for categorization to be linked to identity. The case study for our analysis of intergroup processes is the Robbers Cave Experiment by Musa Fern Sheriff and Carolyn Sheriff and their colleagues. One thing that they noticed when they first created their two groups, the Rattlers and the Eagles, was that the just just the very creation of a group identity, uh, a sense that one was a member of the group, uh, the idea that one became a rattler, and that rattlers were different from eagles, seemed to be sufficient to spark uh, hostility, uh, a negativity towards outgroup members. Uh, to read from their analysis, when the in-group began to be clearly delineated, there was a tendency to consider all others as outgroup. The Rattlers didn't even know another group existed in the camp until they heard the Eagles on the Ball Diamond. But from that time on, the group, the outgroup figured prominently in their lives. Hill, who was a Rattler, said, they better not be in our swimming hole. The next day Simpson heard tourists on the trail just outside the camp and was convinced that, quote, those guys, unquote, were down on our field again. It suggests, this, this particular passage suggests that uh, simply creating an in-group might be sufficient to trigger uh, negative reactions to the out-group. That basic idea was investigated by Tashfield and Turner in their research, which used what they called the minimal intergroup situation. Uh, they were interested in studying the factors that can, can sustain bias, stereotyping, conflict between groups. In, in some ways, like the sheriffs, they tried to create a minimal situation to start adding on additional factors to see how much these factors contribute to intergroup conflict. So they started with a very, very basic kind of intergroup situation. They brought people together and separated them into two groups. And the separation of two groups was based on a, a completely trivial factor. Um, so, for example, it might be that um, they told individuals that you are going to be part of Group A. It's because you like this kind of art. And the people over there, well, they're in Group B, uh, and they like another kind of art. Uh, during the, the study, uh, the group members discovered that they'd be asked to distribute resources uh, among the people assembled in the room. As they distributed those resources, uh, they tended to favor members of their own group. Um, e even though these groups existed only in their minds, they, 
they serve no purpose. The members never interacted with each other. Uh, Tashvell and Turner concluded it's the mere perception of belonging to two distinct groups. That is, social categorization per se is sufficient to trigger intergroup discrimination favoring the in-group. So it was the idea that categorization, mere categorization, uh, can trigger initially uh, a negative reaction towards those who are members of other groups. As researchers continue to investigate the psychological ramifications of groups and people's reactions to members of outgroups, they identified uh, a systemic tendency for people to simply favor the in-group and judge more negatively the out-group. Uh, it was the sociologist William Graham Sumner who coined the term ethnocentrism to describe the belief that one's own group, in particular tribes or regions or country, uh, larger groups, are superior in most ways to other tribes, other regions, other countries, other groups. At the group level, ethnocentrism is the in-group, out-group bias. Subsequent research by Marilyn Brewer and her colleagues suggests that this is a pervasive bias. Although in-group positivity, the favoring one, one's own group, tends to be slightly stronger than out-group negativity, uh, particularly among groups which are successful and prospering. Um, so such groups tend to favor their, their own group. They might be less likely to condemn out-group members. Other research suggests that very frequently people use a double standard in evaluating the actions of their own group member um, and positively and a different standard for evaluating the actions of an out-group member. So for example, pride in, in your group is described as nationalism or patriotism. But if another group takes pride in, in their country, it might be described as ethnocentrism. Uh, if during a negotiation we decide to offer the other group a concession, um, but if the other group offers us a concession, we may interpret it as a, as a manipulative ploy of some kind. If we decide we're going to stand by our principles, um, we, are, we are being just and um, have high integrity. If another group member, an out-group member, says, I can't do this, I'm going to stand on my principles, they're described as being stubborn, if you will. Other sorts of processes are often noted, and we even find evidence of these processes using the uh, implicit, uh, the implicit association test, the IAT, developed by Tony Greenwald and his colleagues. He does find using that technique that even though individuals might deny that they favor their group and that they do not have negative feelings towards the out-group, this indirect measure of their emotional reactions to the in-group and the out-group often it detects uh, the unconscious bias that they deny consciously. Uh, other biases which occur more cognitive ones there's a, quite a list of them here the outgroup homogeneity bias the group attribution error the ultimate attribution error and stereotypes as described in more detail in, in chapter 14 all these biases uh, contribute to people's tendency to misunderstand outgroup members uh, for example to assume that all group members are similar um, even if you simply observe one or two members of the outgroup from them you are happy to generalize to all members of the outgroup. Uh, you would not do that. Uh, you would not generalize quite so freely to members of the in-group if you see your in-group members, one or two in-group members, acting a particular way. Uh, the group attribution error, um, as investigated by Scott Allison and his colleagues, uh, is the tendency to assume that specific group members' personal characteristics and preferences, including their attitudes and their decisions, are similar to the group to which they belong. This is a more general error. It, it would occur if, for example, um, you hear that a person, well, you hear that, for example, Don Forsythe, who is a faculty member at the University of Richmond. Uh, you may hear that the University of Richmond faculty uh, recently voted to accept uh, uh, a new provost as their leader. 
you may then immediately assume that Don Forsyth, who is a member of that group, also favored the appointment of this particular individual. That would be an example of the group attribution error. The ultimate attribution error um, occurs when individuals attribute negative actions. They observe negative actions performed by a member of the outgroup, and they assume those negative actions are caused by dispositional characteristics and qualities of the outgroup member. In many cases, uh, individuals, both in-group members and out-group members, act in ways because they're substantially constrained by the situation. Uh, they have no choice to act in other ways. Uh, but we tend to overlook the force of those situational factors and instead make dispositional inferences about the causes of the behavior of out-group members. Of all the cognitive biases, however, stereotyping, the tendency to make broad, sweeping generalizations about members of other groups um, is probably the most pervasive of all the cognitive biases. Uh, we assume that all members of the outgroup are not just similar and, and not just that their actions are caused by their dispositional features, but we assume that they all have certain characteristics that they share in common. And even when we learn that we gather evidence that suggests these stereotypes are incorrect, we still tend to cling to this mistaken beliefs. Uh, the very concept of, of, of stereotype, as first coined by the journalist Walter Lippmann, uh, suggests that uh, these, these cognitive structures, uh, this scaffolding, um, tend to stamp themselves upon the evidence that we gather and so constantly reaffirm themselves. Uh, recently the stereotype content model has tried to describe how our stereotypes about individuals and groups are tied up to our emotional reactions to them. Uh, the two dimensions stressed in this particular model um, are the competency, the viewed competency of the group and the warmth, the relationality of the of the out group or even the in group. So, uh, for example, um, if a group is viewed as um, not particularly warm and relational but highly competent, um, then we would experience the emotion of envy. Um, envy is most likely when the out group, although judged negatively, is nonetheless higher in status than the in group. And that status difference is thought to be due to the competence of the outgroup. Uh, contempt, on the other hand, occurs when the outgroup is most is is very negatively stereotyped, um, and therefore is viewed both as very low in terms of competence and also low in warmth. Pity, uh, in contrast, when an intergroup emotion is directed at outgroups that are viewed negatively in terms of competence but are thought to have some positive, possibly even endearing qualities. Um, admiration is a possible emotion for people to experience in intergroup situations, uh, but it's relatively rare, particularly if the groups are adversarial ones, but uh, admiration would occur when you view the outgroup members as highly competent and uh, plus the, the very warm, positive individuals as well. Um, in, in most cases, we reserve um, both of those evaluations, competency and warmth, for our, our own group. In cases where the, the interactions between the group members become extremely negative, cognitive processes come online, which which sustain, um, rationalize the negative treatment that uh, our group, the in-group, may be inflicting on the out-group. Uh, two of these related processes have been described as uh, moral exclusion, where the uh, members of the in-group psychologically um, come to the conclusion that uh, the members of the out-group can be treated unfairly in, in unjust ways uh, because they have done something which has stripped them of their moral rights. Uh, and in the most extreme case, the, they're, they're not just 
not viewed as uh, protected by morality, uh, but they're not viewed as human any longer, and that's when dehumanization occurs. This generally, this reaction is one which is most likely to be seen in cases of extreme conflict between groups. Um, and as Alport explained, uh, although we often become angry towards individuals, um, hatred, people rarely use the hatred word hatred unless they're describing individuals who are collected into groups. Um, all of these processes are psychological ones and questions arise uh, about what's the function of these, this pervasive tendency to view the outgroup negatively. And one theoretical analysis which has emerged to explain these reactions is social identity theory. And as we've discussed in earlier presentations, social identity theory assumes that your sense of self is not based simply on your personal characteristics, but also on the characteristics of the group to which you belong. And that as you more and more strongly identify with your group, um, and as that group identity becomes clearer to you, and you recognize that you belong to that category and identify with it, it is more likely that you will generate a negative reaction to the outgroup. So you will emphasize your group's achieve achievements. You will certainly favor your group and your group members and engage in stronger outgroup rejection. So it's, it's very important to distance your group and champion your own group over the outgroup. Um, those tendencies will generate increased self-esteem. Um, the research does suggest that social identity processes are implicated in intergroup conflict situations because the more, obviously, the more a person identifies with the in-group, then the more likely uh, they will tend to reject the out-group. Although it's not clear, out-group rejection raises their self-esteem. In these presentations, we've looked at, at two components of intergroup relations. We've looked at the causes, we looked at the intergroup biases. What remains is an analysis of conflict resolution, and we'll turn to that in our final presentation on this chapter. Thank you.